Okay, so thank you for coming and welcome to this uh, public lecture by Dr. Lewis Tunstall. Lewis got a PhD in uh, theoretical and mathematical physics from the University of Adelaide. And then he had the first phase in his career as a theoretical physicist, again in Adelaide and in Bern, after which he switched to research in artificial intelligence. He is, uh, at the moment, a key member of the research team at Hugging Face. You can see his shirt as well. And if you want to know what he has been involved in, well, we are all aware of the great success of uh, Chat GPT. Well, behind them, behind that, there is mainly the great success of a deep learning architecture, which is known as Transformers, and Lewis gave great contributions to that. Uh, also, if you are interested in, he is one of the author of a very popular book, very popular and good book on the subject, right? We are interested in that because, first of all, we are curious about the architectures themselves, but also, as theoretical physicists, we are curious about what we can do. And all this topical day was an example of that. At the same time, we think that, <coughs> sorry, such a subject can be interest, and in view of that, should be open to at least some comprehension from general public. For all that, many thanks to Luis. So thank you very much for the introduction and uh, invitation to come talk to an audience of uh, former colleagues uh, in, in physics. And what I do at Hugging Face uh, at the moment is I, I try to train language models to follow my instructions. And they're, they're not quite good enough at, uh, at physics, so I think we're quite safe uh, in our jobs. And so this isn't a talk about you know, the end in sight for, for um, you know, the kind of science we do. Um, but in particular, what I want to talk a bit about is a kind of high-level view of some of the applications of AI, and in particular, deep learning, um, to a few different branches of the natural sciences. And um, yeah, I think we'll have some time for questions at the end, and happy to dive into more details. So, as Francesco mentioned, I, um, I started off uh, doing quantum field theory um, in my PhD and my postdoc at Bern, and um, I was heavily focused in um, uh, sort of chiral perturbation theory and effective field theories for the strong nuclear force. And um, sort of towards the end of my postdoc, um, I was hanging out with a, a friend from uh, the CMS experiment at CERN, and uh, he was telling me about this kind of problem he was trying to solve um, around uh, like jet tagging. So I guess for most people here, um, you're familiar with that, but the, the basic idea is uh, at the LHC, you have these proton collisions and they produce huge collimated sprays of particles that you know, deposit energy in the calorimeter. And the kind of key kind of challenge is to figure out how to identify um, you know, what are the kind of particles associated with these jets um, so that you can then very effectively filter the, the huge amounts of data coming from the LHC. And the, you know, I'd heard this many times from, from other theorists who were working on this. And um, the surprising thing he showed me was that uh, he was using a technique which was unfamiliar to me at the time called uh, deep learning um, to basically uh, convert uh, these um, energy depositions on the calorimeter into images um, and then using a type of neural network called a convolutional network uh, to distinguish you know, between the signal and the background. Um, and at the time, I was very much a pen and paper theorist. I had done some Fortran in undergrad and been scarred for life. And um, this was sufficiently interesting that I thought, okay, maybe I'll, I'll start learning a bit of Python and playing around with um, TensorFlow, which at the time was the kind of current uh, most popular deep learning framework. And as this hobby became more and more exciting, I decided to kind of switch my career away from doing um, more like abstract things uh, in quantum field theory to more like practical things um, around natural language processing. <coughs> 
So the theme of this talk is to sort of talk about some of these developments that have happened in NLP um, and how they can maybe translate into some of the applications of solving uh, sort of problems in scientific discovery and understanding. So to get started, I just want to give an idea or give a sense of like why is there all this fuss um, about AI and you know why is it now and you know why didn't it happen kind of 10 years ago? Um, and you can kind of already get a sense of this from this image. So this is uh, an image from a, a neural network called Stable Diffusion, um, which is an open source uh, model that can basically convert text into images. And in this particular case, the prompt was something like an astronaut riding a horse in space. And up until just a few years ago, asking a neural network to do this task was prohibitively hard. And so what we've seen with these kind of changes is that in the public consciousness, there are now applications um, involving these models uh, which can be used for various uh, creative applications. Um, and we'll see a bit later on um, how they can also be used uh, to tackle some scientific challenges. So let's start with text. Um, for a, a similar kind of parallel to the image one, for many years, um, teaching neural networks to understand or at least extract useful information from text um, was, a, was a kind of open challenge. Um, so before we had neural networks, we had some sort of classical techniques which were based on like linguistic features. Um, but these turned out to be quite brittle um, in the sense that the, the complexity of language um, typically meant you had systems which when you know, people had spelling mistakes or switched uh, verb order, the, the kind of predictions of these models weren't very good. And then um, roughly in around 20, 2015, 2016, there was um, a big breakthrough in um, these uh, so-called recurrent neural networks, which are networks that are used for kind of processing sequential data, um, where they were able to kind of uh, incorporate uh, kind of the information or the correlations that exist in language across different words in a sentence. Um, and later on, this was uh, kind of expanded through the introduction of something called the transformer, which we'll talk about a bit later. But in this example here, on the left, you can see um, we've got a span of text, um, which is the citation of Mary Curie for the Nobel Prize. And you can ask the model, you know, when did she win the Nobel Prize? And it kind of scans through that text and extracts um, the date uh, associated with that. And you might say, OK, fine, like I could just write a regular expression to get these dates. Um, but for these kind of models, you can actually ask many different types of questions. And they will typically do with, um, you know, better than kind of like human accuracy. Um, extract the, the correct information. And then, of course, the, the big change that uh, happened uh, just a couple of months ago uh, was the introduction of ChatGPT by OpenAI. And what's very different about these new types of systems, these so-called generative uh, language models, is that they don't just extract information from existing text, but they can be used to create uh, completely new instances of text. So I asked ChatGPT to write a poem about Mary Curie in the style of Eminem. And you can see, you know, it's like, yo, Mary Curie, the scientific queen, a genius in lab, go and blah, blah, blah. You can get a sense that there's pretty much, I would say, zero chance this exists in the internet. I mean, the internet's a big place, so maybe not. But I'm not sure how many poems of Mary Curie in the style of Eminem there are. So this suggests there's a kind of genuine um, kind of creativity being expressed by these models where they're able to adapt from the style of um, things they've seen in training to completely new uh, prompts at, at inference time. And it's not just text where deep learning has um, had a huge impact. Um, in fact, deep learning originated in terms of its like kind of prominence uh, in computer vision. Uh, so around 2012, there was a famous competition called uh, the ImageNet uh, competition. And this was a competition which was used to benchmark um, various types of um, algorithms to classify um, different images across many um, hundreds of, of different classes. So you've got things like dogs, cats, humans, but then you know, people playing basketball and so on. And uh, deep learning at the time uh, when it came out uh, showed that it got significantly better improvement in terms of the accuracy compared to these kind of classical algorithms at the time. And since then, this is now being kind of uh, expanded into a wide range of different tasks. So it's not just about classifying cute dogs. Um, but you can also provide um, an image to a neural network, and it will be able to also identify all the individual objects in that network, or you may even be able to segment at the pixel level all the different kind of categories and so on. And this is nowadays um, really the kind of best technique we also have 
for extracting information from, from images and is gradually uh, encroaching in the domain of, um, of video as well. And as I mentioned before, we had things like stable diffusion uh, where you could uh, analyze basically text and images. And this is one of the, the sort of first models that uh, really demonstrated that, which was DALI from OpenAI. And again, this has that kind of creativity flavor um, that we saw with ChatGPT where you can provide kind of very bizarre combinations of words like a bowl of soup that looks like a monster knitted out of wool. And the, the model is able to kind of produce something that kind of matches uh, you know, one's expectations. And it's not just for um, you know, text and images where we've seen uh, very large uh, Im implications or impact of deep learning. Um, so Christoph probably knows this much better than me, but uh, Google um, you know, uh, just recently or about a year ago um, sort of mentioned that they had been using these transformer neural networks to kind of augment their search queries. Um, and they found that this produced uh, sort of like the biggest leap forward um, in five years of search, which if you think about how heavily Google search has been optimized is, is a fairly impressive um, uh, improvement. And then, of course, we have other modalities like audio and video uh, where deep learning is now um, being able to basically produce, um, for example, audio that is almost indistinguishable to human ears from like, true audio. So synthetic audio that matches music or you know, your voice um, at a quality that is very hard to tell the difference from. So I want to tell you a little bit about what goes into kind of building um, these systems. And there are roughly like three main ingredients that have led to the, the prominence of deep learning today. So of course, there's the neural networks themselves, but these are actually very old. They go back uh, you know, many decades. Um, and the two real big changing um, features were the massive increase of data um, that was available on the internet for, for training um, these, these deep networks and also very big improvements in hardware. So um, NVIDIA is one of the prominent companies that basically sources most of the GPUs uh, in the world for, for training neural networks. And Google has also uh, invested a lot of resources in building their own chips called TPUs to be able to train ever bigger models. So if we start with like the, the neural networks themselves, um, I guess most people here have probably heard about this kind of like metaphor that they're sort of inspired uh, from, from the human brain. And the, the kind of idea, um, even though the metaphor, I think, breaks down at some level, is that um, you're, you're trying to basically model somehow um, connections um, between different parts of a network that kind of activate on and off um, and, and sort of uh, uh, communicate information across nodes. And so in this case, you know, in, in the, if you look at the human um, neurons, they're, they're, they're rather complex. You've got this like cell body, which then you know, sends signals through these axons. And already, um, you know, uh, for, for many decades, it was observed that these uh, neurons in, in the brain, they kind of arrange themselves in these like layers. And so as you kind of like lay out uh, parts of the brain, you'll see that, um, you know, the, the kind of complexity uh, of the neurons or the sort of information processing um, is kind of built up hierarchically um, through these different layers. And so, in the 40s, which is like, you know, really long time ago, um, McCulloch and Pitts, they sort of asked themselves, could we use that kind of knowledge to build a kind of mathematical kind of abstraction um, of that process? And so they had a, a very simple system um, where basically you provide uh, binary inputs. So these are things which are just like kind of logical expressions like C equals A or C equals A and B or C equals A or B. And the output of that, um, of that neuron is then a binary output, basically, you know, one of these operators and or not. And the kind of idea they had was that you would have each of these like nodes would be somehow representing these neurons or the analogous thing of a neurons. And the links between these neurons would be what are called the connections. And so the hope was that if you had enough of these connections and enough of these neurons, you may be able to model uh, sufficiently complex kind of logical expressions and then maybe um, you know learn something um, kind of intelligent so the the problem with that model um, was that it had this kind of restriction of using kind of binary inputs and outputs and so then uh, roughly 10 years later um, there was a, a new proposal called the perceptron 
which said, okay, maybe we can relax this by now having continuous inputs and continuous outputs, and this is much closer um, as, a, as a sort of abstraction of, of the human neuron. And here what you can see is we've got um, several inputs, so these are x1, x2, x3. They basically um, are mapped, uh, or they multiplied by what are called the weights, and these are, these are the parameters of, of these networks. So you'll often hear people talking about language models having billions of parameters. These are essentially these, um, these weights. And then you have essentially a mathematical operation which just takes a weighted sum of these inputs and these weights and then feeds them through uh, a simple function, which in this case is just the heavy side step function. And so the idea is that here you've got now a kind of more sophisticated abstraction of a neuron which incorporates um, a sort of non-linearity um, through this like uh, step function and this allows you to model more complex and more complicated functions. And then the sort of final missing piece before um, getting into the sort of true uh, deep neural networks um, was taking this idea of, of a perceptron, which is kind of, you can think of it as like a little piece of a broader network, and then kind of building lots of connections across many different um, sort of subparts. So you can see here, um, we've got a, a neural network which has an input layer, it has what's called a hidden layer. So these are essentially all the parts of the network where you can't directly uh, map this to your sort of observables. And then you've got the output layer, which are the things you want to make predictions with. And so this, this kind of uh, MLP uh, forms in some sense like the kind of basis for almost all the neural networks we use today with many sort of tricks and um, you know, ideas that have been extended to kind of uh, make them more efficient at training. And the kind of basic idea here is that um, what you would do is you would, uh, your inputs, they might be, for example, pixels from an image, um, and then they you would feed them through the network, and then you would have some way of kind of computing um, whether that prediction was good or bad, and then you would find a way to kind of optimize the weights and tune them um, using an algorithm uh, called backpropagation, and this would essentially then kind of update all the parameters of the model uh, in a direction that hopefully gets you closer to the predictions you want. And so the, the kind of main thing that um, happened after that, once computing power was, was uh, sufficient, was to go from just having these kind of shallow sort of single layer networks to what are called deep networks. So now you just stack many, many layers on top of each other. And the basic uh, kind of picture here is that as information flows through the network, you're building up uh, kind of numerical representations of those inputs and those, imp and those representations are getting progressively more and more kind of refined as they flow through the network. And this idea of having like a kind of hierarchy of representations um, leads to this kind of idea that, you know, deep learning or deep neural networks in principle can learn um, arbitrary functions. And nowadays there are many different kind of architectures um, for deep neural networks that are, that are used for different applications. And the choice of the neural network often depends on the sort of d domain or the modality of the data you're working with. So if you're dealing with data that has some kind of relational information between it, um, typically you'll use something called a graph neural network. Um, and the reason for choosing different kind of architectures is often around um, having kind of sample efficiency. So you want these networks to kind of learn as quickly as possible um, what the signal is in the data and you can kind of encode what's called a sort of inductive bias into those networks by choosing a different architecture. Now, if you're doing images, then the sort of real common workhorse for this is the convolutional neural network. Um, these have a sort of structure that's inspired a little bit about uh, how vision works also in the, in the brain. And they're, they're, they're very kind of efficient at extracting uh, useful features from, from images. And then the sort of, like, sort of new kid on the block is the transformer uh, neural network. And these transformers, um, they've actually kind of come to kind of generalize almost all the domains, um, or all the different modalities. So originally they were designed for modeling sequential data, uh, like in natural language. Um, but later it was realized that you can actually convert uh, images into like a kind of sequence of, of kind of patches, and then you can model that also with a transformer. And the big kind of main advantage of transformers over previous approaches is that they have a way of parallelizing the kind of computation across sequences, which means that you can train very large networks on very large data sets just by simply scaling up uh, the amount of compute that you have. So 
I mentioned just a little bit about you know, these kind of building blocks that go into networks. I want to just now tell you a little bit about the kind of changes that have happened in the last few years um, around sort of growing these to you know, larger sizes. So the sort of main paradigm shift um, that has occurred has been this idea of instead of training one neural network for a single task, so you can imagine that if I wanted to train something to say classify cats and dogs, I would train one neural network for that. But then if I want to train a neural network that can identify the actual objects in the image, I might train a different neural network for that. Um, there's been a kind of shift in, in how we think of this where you can actually train a kind of base model or a foundation model, um, which is essentially being taught in a sort of semi-supervised way how to extract kind of meaningful representations uh, from the data. And then that kind of base model can be adapted or fine-tuned on the specific task without having to train it from scratch all the time. And the main advantage of this is that the training of these very large networks is often very compute intensive. And if you can do this kind of once and then just do small amounts of training on your tasks, you save yourself a huge amount of compute and you can also re reuse that um, you know, across uh, different uh, communities. So the, the kind of first step in doing this is to gather um, a large amount of kind of generic data so um, if we're thinking of systems like ChatGPT, they're initially trained on essentially huge scrapes of the internet. And the basic idea when you're doing something like language modeling is you provide the neural network with um, some text and you get it to predict the next word or token um, in that sequence. And you do this over and over again. And eventually the model becomes really, really good at autocomplete which turns out to be a, a very powerful way of learning good representations uh, from, from natural language. And you can do this kind of trick also for, for images and also for audio and more recently for video. And this phase of training is, is very intensive. So um, typically you're gonna need uh, hundreds of GPUs um, to, to train a model that is you know, of the scale of maybe uh, 10 billion parameters or larger. Um, and up until recently, uh, it was kind of out of range for most companies, but thanks to some recent innovations in efficiency or training efficiency, this is now becoming progressively more accessible. And to give you an idea of these like kind of tasks that you might do, I mentioned this idea of predicting the next word uh, in a sequence, um, but another thing that is often used is to essentially take a, a sequence um, of, of words or even a sequence of amino acids if you're doing some sort of biological modeling and then you kind of mask out uh, parts of that sequence, and then you get the model to try and predict what are the gaps in that sequence. And this again uh, basically teaches the model or updates the parameters of the model in such a way that it's able to generate uh, good numerical representations of these inputs, which can then be adapted uh, for downstream tasks. And you can also do this, as I mentioned, for computer vision, where you take a lot of unlabeled images and you try to teach the network what is kind of like similar or dissimilar um, between, in this case, you know, pictures of Australia and, you know, pictures of Europe. And in the last few years, the amount of compute um, that is being uh, invested in training these models has, has grown uh, rather rapidly. So you can see here that uh, when the original transformer came out, um, it was around 10,000 petaflops to, to train this. Um, and roughly, you know, every kind of year or two years, it's grown by like a, a factor of, of um, 100. So now the sort of latest state-of-the-art language model, which is GPT-4, um, took 10 billion petaflops to, to train, which, you know, in modern day terms is like an estimated cost of around $100 million. Um, but uh, I, I assume these will go down um, over time. And the reason why people are training such models is because it's been observed that the, the sort of larger the model is in terms of the number of parameters and the amount of data it's seen, um, there are these emergent capabilities that uh, typically arise. So one example here uh, from Google is that um, if you train a, a kind of text-to-image model, um, like stable diffusion, and the, you give it a prompt, which is like a, a photo of a kangaroo wearing an orange hoodie, uh, blah, 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 down by the Sydney house, um, you can see that when the model only has 350 million parameters, it kind of gets the gist of a kangaroo, um, but you know, the text on the sign is kind of garbled, and as you progressively scale up the size of the model, 
at 20 billion parameters, you've now got a kangaroo in front of the Opera House saying, welcome friends on the sign. So this ability to kind of produce progressively, you know, more capable models by scaling them up in size is the main driving factor um, around training uh, all, all these, this growth in compute I was showing you before. And as I mentioned previously, the, the reason why we do this is because when you have these large models that are trained or pre-trained, they can then be adapted uh, for other tasks, like domain-specific tasks, uh, using typically much, much less data. Um, and the performance from that so-called transfer learning of your initial stage to your task um, is typically going to be better than you know, other previous techniques which involve training from scratch. And this has been the kind of main driving force in NLP and computer vision for the last, uh, I would say, five years. So the, the kind of question um, you know, we can ask ourselves is like, there are all these kind of uh, uh, milestones and progress that's happening in the domains of natural language and computer vision. Can we bring some of those over to the natural sciences? And the answer is yes, with some caveats, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, but here's a, a kind of nice image which uh, sort of tries to summarize, you know, the scientific method at a very high level. Um, so you've got this kind of loop where you make some hypotheses, which then prompt you to design experiments, you collect observations, and then if you have a theory, you then compare those theories to those observations, and then you kind of iterate um, through this to sort of find what is at least the, the theory that is most compatible um, with the observations. So, Luigi can probably uh, tell you this will be an underdetermined uh, process, but nevertheless, it's something that seems to, to work relatively well. So here are a couple of um, applications um, where um, artificial intelligence is currently uh, being used. And you can see it spans uh, a wide range of disciplines. We've got, um, for example, um, uh, applications in um, particle collisions, so trying to discover potentially new physics. Um, there's this idea of applying uh, this technique of language modeling that we use from natural language to other types of sequences, like biomedical sequences of amino acids. Um, one of the ones that I'm personally quite interested in as a former theorist is like extracting laws of nature from data. And uh, the other one that uh, made the news um, uh, uh, last year or the year before was um, this idea of whether you can kind of efficiently, uh, you know, iterate on nuclear fusion experiments uh, using uh, artificial intelligence, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But you can see that the kind of spread of, of all applications is fairly large, and this shows that as a general method, um, AI or deep learning kind of, you know, spans or kind of goes horizontally um, through different domains. So. Since you're a physicist, I probably don't need to tell you about this, but uh, as a public lecture, one of the sort of um, kind of interesting applications of deep learning um, is how do you uh, handle the enormous like fire hose of data um, that is uh, collected at the LHC? So in um, some of the experiments, you essentially have proton-proton collisions producing uh, roughly, from what I recall, something like 100 terabytes of, of data per second, and there's no way you can analyze all of that data. So you need a, an efficient way uh, to sift through this. And when you collide these um, protons, you'll typically get, as I've mentioned earlier, sort of jets um, involving charged leptons or jets of quarks and gluons. And because we've got so much data and we have very accurate simulations uh, from the standard model, this is kind of a, an ideal playground for testing out different uh, deep learning methods. And one kind of ap early application um, of deep networks was around uh, trying to see if you could use this to discriminate between uh, new physics and standard model background um, by looking at the transverse momentum um, of, the, of the particles in the calorimeter. And the idea is that if you sum all these momenta in the transverse plane, um, you would expect this to be zero um, if you um, account for things like uh, uh, neutrinos. And if you have an imbalance, then this comes, gives you some uh, sign that there might be something exotic like uh, supersymmetry. And so in 2014, uh, which is almost ancient history by now, this was uh, one of the early papers um, looking at basically could you discriminate between um, a, a signal coming from supersymmetry, where you essentially have um, a, a B quark decaying to these uh, particles called neutralinos, um, versus the, the standard model background. 
And at the time, uh, what they were using were essentially uh, a bunch of features that were sort of uh, extracted uh, from, from the kinematics of the calorimeter. And then you could use that to train essentially a classifier or a tagger which could discriminate between these two types of events. And this, at the time, um, showed it was much better than like previous handcrafted methods, which were typically inspired by um, uh, perturbation theory and some physics intuition. Um, but, but I think um, since then, this has kind of gradually uh, become more sophisticated, involving now transformers to sort of pre-train and learn general representations of, of the collision data. Now, another one um, which is uh, very different uh, as an application is um, can you use neural networks uh, to kind of refine the number of uh, hypotheses um, that are available to you when you're trying to um, design experiments? And perhaps one of the most famous examples of this is in the context of protein folding, where um, for, for many decades, um, it wasn't uh, possible to essentially start from a string of amino acids and then predict accurately the resulting 3D structure of how those amino acids would fold. And the reason why this is uh, kind of an interesting problem is that there's an enormous number of, of proteins um, roughly 200 million uh, possible proteins um, on Earth. And if um, you want to make new types of drugs, then typically what you want to do is understand like how do these uh, proteins interact with each other um, and also what sequence of amino acids will lead to certain structures which I can then test for their efficacy in drug design. And if you don't have an underlying theory like the standard model that you can then you know, simulate and make accurate predictions for, this is a very daunting task involving many kind of um, sort of trial and error iterations where biologists and chemists have to kind of make some informed guesses about what, will, what string will lead to the, the resulting structure. And uh, DeepMind, uh, which is a subsidiary of Google, um, they showed that you could use um, AI systems to essentially learn the relationship from a string of amino acids to the 3D structure. And this is a snapshot of the kind of neural network um, that they, they, they proposed. Um, it's called AlphaFold, and, or AlphaFold2 is the improved version. And um, although some of these uh, words are, are a little bit uh, you know, technical in jargon, uh, the basic idea is you provide this uh, sequence of proteins, and then you extract these like, numerical representations um, from that sequence. Um, and these are these, are these so-called uh, embeddings. And then these embeddings encode this numerical information about the relationship of that sequence. And then this is fed through a bunch of other kind of blocks in the neural network to ultimately predict what, are, what is the actual 3D structure of that resulting fold. And the most impressive thing um, about this was that um, they benchmarked the, um, the AlphaFold1, AlphaFold2 models um, on a very popular uh, benchmark called CASP. And here you can see um, for, for many years the kind of performance of the best performing uh, approaches to predicting the, the 3D structure of proteins was kind of plateauing with some small gains here and there. And so AlphaFold1 was a significant step uh, in improvement going from 40% uh, on this accuracy metric to um, I think 60%. And then AlphaFold2 um, significantly surpassed that by integrating elements of the transformer architecture and this is now, um, the, the sort of latest version of this is now at the level where it's comparable to experimental uh, measurement error. So you can now use AlphaFold to simulate um, the folding of proteins without having to necessarily ask your experimental colleagues to do the actual slow and painstaking process of, of doing the measurements. And so this is one example where if you're trying to uh, sort of narrow the search space of what possible hypotheses, which in this case are um, amino acids or sequence of amino acids, uh, give the desired behavior. Um, AI is, um, is having an impact. And another one is um, about trying to uh, kind of build more efficient ways uh, to generate nuclear fusion. And so this was, again, another landmark paper by uh, DeepMind uh, in collaboration with EPFL in Switzerland. And the, the basic challenge that the, the nuclear fusion lab had in Switzerland was they have this thing called a tokamak, which is essentially a, a giant magnetic ring. Uh, 
or a sort of ring of magnetic coils, and you use these magnetic coils to try and control um, the fusion reaction and the shape of that reaction uh, inside uh, this tokamak. And what the um, kind of challenges were for this lab is that the um, time it takes to, to sort of run the experiment um, and then cool it down is, is very slow. So I think from memory, around three seconds of actual runtime of this experiment then take um, something like, I think, a day to cool it down before you can iterate again. So that's a very slow iteration cycle. Um, and even though you have simulations um, of that fusion reaction, those simulations themselves uh, are quite slow. And so what DeepMind uh, did in this paper was they showed that you can actually train um, an agent. So this is, like, this is a special kind of neural network um, which essentially learns uh, from, from this simulated data what are the kind of uh, uh, sort of actions it should take in order to control these coils in such a way that you produce the kind of desired uh, shape of this like, you know, plasma. And so here you can see um, on the right hand side a couple of these like, different shapes that were sort of the, the things that the experimentalists were trying to control. And the, 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 the agent was able to kind of do that in essentially an automatic way um, by kind of learning from the simulated data what were the correct uh, decisions to make um, over time. And changing gears a bit, another kind of application um, has been um, around learning, um, like we're dealing with graphs or data that has a graph modality. And this uh, turns out to be quite uh, kind of pervasive uh, in the natural sciences. So in the context of, of particle physics, um, I was talking about you know, jet tagging. This is an example where you can think of the kind of uh, you know, momenta that you know, you've got for your inputs is like ordered and has some relationships between it. Um, but you can also think of other dynamical systems like n-body systems or you know, molecules also having this kind of relational uh, information between them. And so if you want to kind of capture those kind of relationships uh, on, on, on these uh, kind of graphs, then the natural thing is to try and you know, train a neural network that mimics that. And one of the, for me personally, most exciting applications of this has been the, the sort of potential to learn the underlying like, mathematical um, or symbolic expressions um, describing the, the natural laws kind of directly from, from the data. And uh, there's this uh, very interesting uh, paper that came out uh, about two years ago showing that um, if you just take something like a simple data set of like sort of free particles, um, you know, with some gravitational field, you could uh, model this and then learn um, things like, you know, the, the spring, uh, spring laws. Uh, oh, sorry, that's a different system. That's one where you've just got um, some sort of springs between them. Um, but sorry, the more interesting one is where you take a dark matter simulation and you use this to try and see if you can predict um, the evolution um, of that system. And uh, what they um, ended up finding was that you can get this uh, kind of uh, sort of symbolic representation which kind of match uh, some phenomenological models uh, that cosmologists had developed. And the, the basic way this works is you, you treat the equations, the space of equations that you're trying to model as a binary tree. And then you need to search through this tree to identify which nodes of these equations um, are essentially the most compatible uh, with the data. And so in this example, you can see that, um, let me see at the top. Yeah, you've got um, a, a kind of simple expression here, like 1s plus 3p minus 6. And so you can express that equation in terms of this uh, binary tree. And then the idea is to kind of iterate through, um, through this uh, tree and figure out which subparts of that tree um, are compatible or consistent with the data, and when not, um, to eliminate it, and then to grow the tree um, in different ways, and then iterate this in a sort of evolutionary sense. And in the particular case of what they were studying, which was trying to, to learn um, like laws of, of gravitation, um, what they were doing was using um, the positions and velocities of orbital data um, to essentially train one of these graph neural networks to be able to predict the next step in your, in your phase space. And so here you can see a kind of schematic of how the information is encoded. So you start off with positions and velocities, and then you 
kind of compress that into these, um, these graph um, representations. And then these, these graphs or these graph neural networks, they essentially communicate across the nodes and pass information about like the sort of local dynamics uh, in the system. And then at the end, you get a prediction for the next step um, of your dynamical system. And if you take that representation and then you apply this evolutionary uh, tree search to try and find which sets of symbols are most uh, compatible uh, with your data, then what you find um, is this kind of um, uh, spike here, which is telling you that um, you know, the, uh, the equation giving you the inverse square law is the one that's um, like most consistent uh, with the data, and you can then see the predictions um, of that uh, model with, um, uh, with the observational data. And this is, of course, maybe simple because, okay, we've known Newton's law for several hundred years, but you can imagine that if you're trying to search for new phenomena or you're dealing with uh, complex systems where you don't actually know what the underlying dynamics are, uh, this seems like a potentially interesting way to extract uh, phenomenological expressions. So this isn't to say everything is like amazing and you know, game over, we should just give up and stop doing uh, you know, things ourselves. There are some major challenges in, in trying to apply um, AI and deep learning to the natural sciences. Um, probably one of the big ones is reproducibility. So, um, you know, as a, as a former theorist, you could read another paper, you could then try to derive the expressions, and then you could sort of convince yourself that what they had was true. Um, but once you start dealing with um, very large uh, data sets and models that are large and complex code bases, the actual ability to reproduce uh, the results of other labs uh, gets progressively harder. And at Hugging Face, that's something that uh, we work on a lot by trying to make the sort of um, reproducibility and sort of transparency um, around machine learning um, easier through um, the ability to share uh, models and data sets uh, very easily. Um, and another one is this uh, problem of dual use. So you've probably tried to ask ChatGPT uh, things that it doesn't want to answer. Um, for example, if you ask ChatGPT um, to, I don't know, write a, a story about, I don't know, some royal people getting murdered in like the style of um, uh, George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones, it will say, sorry, as a language model, I'm not allowed to talk about these violent things. And that's because the model has been trained to align to a certain set of preferences um, that the annotators uh, OpenAI um, used um, to prevent it from doing that. And that's actually generally a good thing because as these language models uh, become more capable, their ability to uh, be used to potentially, I don't know, help you design an experiment for nefarious purposes um, becomes increasingly more pervasive. And then this also applies to other systems where, you know, maybe you can imagine a future version of AlphaFold um, might have implications where you can now, you know, generate synthetic or do some sort of organic synthesis uh, to build, you know, pathogens that we, we don't want to have in, the, in society. So navigating this kind of natural openness we have in science versus the, the downstream implications of that um, is, is an open challenge. And the, the other one is that all of these models, they pick up what are called biases uh, from, from the training data that that's used. So if you um, essentially have observational data that has uh, errors in it, the model will learn um, how to mimic those errors. Um, and this is then a problem if you want to use that for, for inference and you want to make scientific predictions, you're going to struggle uh, to, to, to deal with the, those kind of um, uh, uncertainties. Um, and then the last one is um, a sort of old challenge in, in any sort of machine learning application is the ability to generalize to sort of out of domain um, situations. And uh, an example of this is that, you know, if the model has only been trained uh, to see like dogs and cats, and then you show it a giraffe, um, it will typically get confused about you know, what it should predict for that. And uh, this is generally a kind of limitation um, of the fact that we only have a finite amount of data of a certain diversity, and humans are kind of surprisingly robust at sort of generalizing to unseen cases, and we haven't yet quite figured out how to do that for, for neural networks. And with that, I'll uh, stop to take some questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Luis. So, question.
should have put more equations. <laughs> So if I give chat uh, the Keplerian orbit information or data, could it derive Newton's laws of motion <laughs> or gravitation? So, I mean, has this been tried yet? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, I've tried these things. It, it fails quite badly. Um, and uh, there's a, an interesting paper by uh, several pure mathematicians who tried to see if you take a bunch of uh, famous problems in mathematics, how far can you get? And they found that even the current state-of-the-art model, which is GPT-4, is roughly at the level of like a mediocre grad student, um, which sounds maybe, OK, we're far away, um, but is at least fairly impressive that this uh, next word prediction task uh, generates a richness uh, in, in these things. Um, having said that, I do know that um, companies like OpenAI and Anthropic uh, have been working a lot to in improve the scientific reasoning abilities of their models. And uh, there's, a, there's another model called Claude 2, which is, is very impressive. If you probe it about physics and you ask it to try and help you prove, like the Nambu-Goldstone theorem, for example, it does an OK job um, at helping you. So maybe, maybe a few years and we'll see. But it's an open question, right? Maybe there's a limit. I mean, maybe, maybe you're ba upper bounded uh, by you know the data that you train on, and you now need to harness the the expert data from people like yourselves to then train the, the next generation models. And the second is, how do you? I mean, there's a lot of concern about the misanthropic use of AI. Mm -hmm. How does how do you see that evolving and the protections against that? Yeah, uh, I don't want to predict the future because <laughs> I'm always wrong. Um, I would say, so, so from what I can see, there's, um, with the current technology we have today, um, the, the main risks are kind of near term. So for example, uh, one thing that policymakers are concerned around is like misinformation and disinformation from language models. Um, and it's pretty clear that if you take ChatGPT, you can generate tons of spam and things like this. Um, and one of the big open challenges is that even though these language models have guardrails uh, integrated into them through the training process, um, people have shown you can always work around this by providing a prompt that kind of basically tricks the model into just then helping you with whatever you want. So at the moment, we don't have any like solid way of um, defending from, from this. Um, what I can see potentially a future is where um, most models have to be released in a kind of staged manner. So one of the proposals on the table is that if you train another next generation language model, it has to go through some sort of audit um, to probe its ability for these like dual use cases. Um, whether that turns out to be you know, globally enforceable, I think it remains to be seen. But it's an interesting one where um, you can already see in some of these models, like their ability to like deceive humans is, is getting kind of, you know, in the uncanny valley. And probably we do need some, like, kind of auditing. Um, and then the other side of this is maybe the positive side, um, which is that we've often had to grapple with, like, dual-use technologies. And generally speaking, society has more good people than bad people. So the question is, ultimately, what power does this technology have relative to the amount of, like, good things we can generate? And um, I don't know how that will turn out, but it's still an open question. Uh, and by taking the analogy with like humans further, it seems kind of tempting to couple these things to like real-time sensors, uh, so that the brain can learn from like real-time data. Is there anything? Is this way too slow to learn from? Like the, the machine can learn from observations in real time, or? Um, is there any? So, use I, I, are you thinking about like a kind of online learning? thing where you have continual new data coming in and then updating? Yeah, yeah. like a, 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 um, a video camera. I, yeah, it's I, I, a good question. I think um, 
As far as I know, when it comes to things like language models or at least the image models, um, no one has figured out how to do online training in an efficient way. Um, so typically speaking, um, to get these capabilities, you need enormous data sets, um, terabytes of data. And then the question is like, uh, you know, how would you do that in an online fashion? Because the, the kind of model takes a long time to actually grow and learn these, these features. Um, perhaps the solution to your question would involve finding more sample efficient ways of training neural networks. Uh, a common criticism, which is a valid one, is that um, they typically take billions of examples to do things that for us are relatively simple. And so if we found more efficient algorithms for training, maybe then such a thing would be possible. But uh, today it's, I think, out of reach. Um, thanks for the talk. What about sentience? <laughs> what, what does the community think? I mean, is there, what's the broad outlines of the discussion on whether AI can become sentient and when, for example, if, if possible? Wow, that's a hard topic. Uh, I'm also on camera, so I have to be <laughs> careful how much uh, rage on Twitter I want to get. Um, so I would say to take the, the Swiss position is, um, uh, I would say roughly there's kind of two diverging camps. Um, one is that these, uh, say, language models, they, they don't have a true understanding of the language um, that they're modeling. And therefore, they don't have like a, a theory of mind, and they don't have um, a sense of self and those things. So there's no um, kind of chance that the current models um, have any degree of, of sentience. And probably in that respect, I think most people in the community would agree the current systems don't have that. Um, but there is a, a kind of interesting perspective that um, currently we are adding more um, capabilities to models that are getting a bit closer to what humans do. So for example, um, I mentioned this idea of having an agent control the fusion reactor. Um, you can now use language models and give them access to things like the internet and uh, Python and other types of tools. And that gives them a sort of sense of agency. So you can say, you know, give me an answer to this question. And then it takes a sequence of actions in the real world to gather that answer and give you a response. And once you start giving um, objects agency, you start getting a bit maybe closer to, to, to something that we have. Um, and then, of course, the, the big philosophy question is, you know, what is sentience? You know, what is consciousness? And so on. And um, if you think about things that these models don't have, another one is like memory. They don't have any state that they remember what happened yesterday or they remember, you know, the previous conversation. Most of their memory is basically limited at the moment to uh, a few pages of, of text. I mean, some extreme cases may be a book of text, but they don't have a, a sense of memory. So perhaps if we build memory, we add agency, um, we may get something like a rudimentary form uh, of sentience, but uh, I, I can't uh, say much more than that. I'm wondering, since we are basically statistical physicists, um, this, is anyone looking or exploring what happens when you inject noise and the coefficients on training data or on the outputs? So we were wondering all the time now how reliable or how interpretable the results are. But um, and I remember about 10, 15 years ago, a lot of the research in neural networks was about stochastic systems, Boltzmann and yep. machines. And today it's all deterministic. Uh, the last thing I think is the variational autoencoder, mm -hmm. which looks completely different now from anything anyone else does. But do people research what happens if you in inject noise and how reliable the systems are if they start hallucinating more? Yeah. Um, I, I would say there's, there's a few different sources of noise that are, that are used. So if you're training um, computer vision models, for example, um, a, t a type of noise is to uh, rotate, shift, flip, uh, blur the, the input images, and that gives you better generalizability um, for the final model. But I think you're asking more about noise in the training dynamics. Um, yeah, the, the first thing would be more like imposing symmetry. Yeah, okay, very good question. So, um, for example, these uh, graph neural networks, they often are designed uh, to actually encode 
explicit symmetries like not quite the SUN type ones that we use, but things like equivariant, they call them equivariant symmetries. They're like a sort of reduced, it's like simplified Lie groups to the ones we have. And then those then um, turn out to be very sample efficient. So you're, you're kind of making the, the network have some kind of bias towards modeling a certain type of uh, data. So if your data is maybe 3D and has a rotational symmetry, you can actually in, incorporate that into your network. Um, but the question about the, the noise is that there is an inherently stochastic element to these, to these networks. So first of all, uh, we, we initialize them uh, randomly, and that is sampled from some distribution, and the choice of distribution turns out to matter a lot. Um, and secondly, the, the process of um, updating these weights goes through this uh, stochastic gradient descent, or variance of that, where essentially you, you take, um, uh, you've got this kind of very high dimensional uh, loss uh, landscape, and you're trying to find one of these local minima in that space. And uh, the, the sort of local minimum you end up with uh, may be different depending on the sort of random seed you start your network. And people have found that there are, depending on the, the domain, significant differences between just the choice of random seed. So there, there, there is this like noisy process um, in, in this. And as far as I know today, most of this is evaluated empirically. So you, you, you run your experiment on different seeds, you look at like the, the standard deviation and you go, okay, my thing is more or less converging. Okay, I think we can finish. And thank you very much indeed again, Lewis. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Thank you. And please remember.